There's no biblical verse that says a Christian can have a demon. And any deliverance minister out there saying that there's a biblical verse, you are lying. Well, then why say it? I'm discovering something that I believe can allude to it. One of my pet peeves, and I think it's biblically based, I think this is God's pet peeve, that people who go outside the text who don't have a biblical basis teach things as though these are hard and fast rules, as though, as though this is a rock solid teaching. One of those things, and I'm, I'm going to keep harping on this until the cows come home or until the Lord takes me home, that is this teaching about uh, demons occupying or controlling or possessing or demonizing a Christian, whichever terminology you want to use, as well as Christians being under a curse, a generational curse. None of those things are found in the Bible. And so I'm going to keep railing this point until I can get people, especially prominent people, to stop teaching this thing and to get people who are buying this stuff to stop buying this stuff. Is this going to ever end? Probably not, which means I'll do this for the rest of my life. And so don't let this get old because this is what we're called to do. We are called to contend for the faith. Now, there might be someone out there that teaches this thing and they might do so Honestly, they are genuinely believing that this is, they're sincere in their belief, but they are still wrong. They are sincerely wrong. Well, we need, to, we need to reach out to them as well. But then also there are some who know full well that this is not true, that this is false, it's fake, it's fraudulent, and do so anyway. Why? Because of the lure of either fame, money, uh, things like that. They want to be known for this, irrespective of if it goes against the scriptures. Well, there was a conversation just recently with uh, Alexander Pagani, who I've had on the channel before. I've tried to get him to kind of go over these things, go in depth. He didn't want to at the time, didn't. And as his, his response was, uh, I'm not going to convince uh, you. You're not going to convince me and, and so forth. OK, fine. Well, he goes on to Bible dingers. And I think after a couple of years of me and others kind of hounding and pushing and try to do so as respect respectfully as we can. Some folks do it, uh, go overboard. Maybe I've gone overboard. I don't know. But the goal is to pull out what the text says. And if I'm wrong, fine. And you need to show me. If this is true, you need to show me and others. If it's not true, then I need to show you and others. And so he asked a couple things on Bible dingers. And I think the, the response is alarming, I think so, and troubling. And so let's go ahead and jump into this. Now, this is where they're talking about him and his book. And he's speaking about people having demons in body parts and the, the, the back end of people, uh, people who may have engaged in certain uh, ungodly sexual behaviors that this that there may have they may have a demon there. And so that's where the, the conversation picks up. Maybe I'll take way, it I out in, bring the it back. in the yeah. future. I'll take it out. Maybe yeah. if it's yeah. becoming a problem, I'm going to take it out. Yeah. You know that, right? Yeah, no, We're bringing it back to love. This We're bringing good. it back. Now, what he, what they're talking about is that he says that um, he's not, I guess, sold on this. I'm not really sure. He's thinking that maybe he ought to pull it out if it's calling causing confusion, that part of the book, which is something I think you probably should never put it in the first place. Uh, you've got to understand who your audience is, people who've never heard of you or those that do hear you, because there's a tendency amongst people in this deliverance ministry arena to sometimes label everything a demon. There's a demon of this, a spirit of this, a spirit of that, and the Bible doesn't say that. Whatever you say, if the Bible doesn't say, then that is textbook definition of you adding to the scripture, especially if you're teaching this, if people understand this. And we know people understand this to be your teaching because they tell us. They say, no, Corey, you, I, I, I've experienced it. I'm a Christian. I have it. They, they, they go off of their experience and what gives them validity are these books, these teachings, these sermons, these conferences that you guys are putting on. And so he's saying that maybe I should not have put this in the book uh, if it's going to cause this much confusion. And he's using a couple of texts, uh, the woman bent over by a spirit uh, and a couple other passages, pro pro probably that a demon can be in you and cause you to have these physical ailments. Now, this is kind of where we pick back up into the whole conversation. And back to love, yeah. but just because I think this is, I think theological conversations are important because that's how we learn, I think, right? what the Bible says. Um, so anyways, I think my issue is that this is sort of the linchpin of the argument for Christians having a demon right. is that um, 
the person who believes this would say that the demon is not in control of their soul or spirit they're in control of their physical body right and so this is the key verse to build the entire doctrine of christians having demons on i've never seen that i've never heard that i'm not even sure where you've gotten that from i've never seen anybody build a whole theology on a christian having a demon based on that story no now if you would have said ephesians now i don't know where he, why he's saying this because i've literally heard him say say this particular passage before because what people would say is that demons don't get in you but they are they can be spatially on you uh they can be geographically in the same location as the holy spirit or possibly on the flesh and so this passage in luke about the woman who is bent over because she has this spirit uh, that's causing her to be bent over. I've literally heard every other person who do, who does deliverance ministries. I've literally heard them use this particular passage. He said he hasn't fine. I'll take him in his word. Although I think I've heard him say the same thing. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but how he's never heard others say this, uh, by the way, he's literally using this to back up a point in his book. And so he has used this, at least to some degree. There's some confusion here, but I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on this. Three, not do not give place to the devil. Then I would say theology on a Christian having a demon based on that story. No. Now, if you would have said Ephesians chapter three, not do not give place to the devil. Then I would say in that verse, we build a lot of Christian having a demon. I've never heard a Christian having a demon, the premise of that line of thinking based on Luke chapter 11. I've never seen. Now, let me go to this passage that he's speaking of. He, he misspoke. He said uh, Ephesians 3 is actually Ephesians 4, 27. Let's go and read Ephesians 4, 27 and see what it says. And this has nothing to do with a demon or a Christian having a demon. And he's making the, the, the statement. He makes a statement that that and maybe another statement that kind of that, that, that that's what they're building off of that Christians could possibly have a demon. Look what it says. He says, and give, matter of fact, before we go to verse 27, let's go to verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another and be angry, yet do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity or some, some version would say place. And the reason why they would say the word place is the word top on. Well, why? And he talks about this possibly being just semantics. No, there's a reason why. The proper uses of this is opportunity or give an opportunity to take advantage of this because that's how the word is used. It's used there in other places. And so do we think that we're giving the devil actual, literal real estate, geography, a physical location? No, that's not what's happening. He says he's speaking of when you do certain things, it does give the enemy an opportunity or an occasion that he can use it. Well, how does that work? Now, does the Bible give us a lot of detail? No. But think about it this way. If you, uh, if someone who is, who could be not a believer has a demon and they see you angry or upset, well, that person who has a demon or being moved by the, the enemy can then come and exacerbate the problem. Have you ever been angry, upset, and then somebody somewhere, sure enough, is going to come and do even more to just really irk you, to kind of tee you off? It happens. When you talk about, let's say you might be fasting and all you're doing is you're thinking about yourself being hungry. What happens? Somebody's going to come and offer you some food. Matter of fact, your favorite food. It's kind of how it works. The enemy, he, he can't be in you and he can't be on you, but he's certainly around you. And so when you do certain things such as a sin or contemplate a sin or get close to it, you give the devil an opportunity. That's all this passage is speaking of in no way, shape or fashion. Is it speaking of a person being demonized or having a demon? None of the words that are used in the Bible about a person being demonized or a dominic survive or uh, having a demon or possessed or oppressed. None of those Greek words are used here. So that was never contemplated here. I've seen that. Okay. I've never seen that. This is the first time that I'm actually hearing that. When we when we say Christian can have a demon, obviously let's establish this because I think I spoke to this to you with uh, Nick about this. There's no biblical verse that says a Christian can have a demon. And any deliverance minister out there saying that there's a biblical verse, you are lying. Well, then why say it? Why would you say it if there is no biblical verse that says a Christian can have a demon? Why then would you say that? Why would you teach that? 
Why would you give people the idea that they can? Clearly, they believe that. How do I know? I literally went to your uh, deliverance conference here in Dallas, your mass deliverance, and it was full of people who were praising, singing hymns and singing Christian songs and reading the Bible and praying and praising and so forth and uh, speaking in tongues, all the different things that you guys would say seems to be hallmarks or character traits of a Christian. And then you invite these Christians to come up for deliverance. So you're clearly you're teaching that you've got you've given the impression you've written about that. You've spoken about that. You and I have a conversation about that. And so clearly you're saying, even if you're not saying up front, although you did say in the past that Christians can have a demon and you're guessing that now there's no scripture for that. Why would you teach that? Why would you teach something that possibly is not true as though it's doctrine? And then have people come to different conferences or churches or what have you, lead them to believe that that's exactly what the Bible teaches. You are lying. We built this line of thinking based on a bunch of different verses that allude to that happening. If a Christian opens the door to the devil, the devil has a place. Again, and notice what's, ha what's happening off of one or two, one or two verses that allude to that. That's very dangerous. And we'll come back to this in a second. Now, we could sit here and argue about yeah. advantage and all this other stuff. That's word semantics. Again, that we're just going to sit here and argue until we blew in the face. Mm -hmm. No, a good pastor, a good preacher, a good exegete, um, we all should want to look at the text and make sure that we say what it says. We want to teach, as Paul says, teach what comports with sound doctrine. We want to teach the gospel. As Titus 1.9 says, we want to hold to the true doctrine of faith, and we want to refute those who contradict it. Well, contradict what? Well, if you're going to say that the Bible teaches or alludes to that a Christian can have a demon, but we see no example. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that those who have the spirit in us is greater than the spirit than anything outside, and that the enemy, the evil one, cannot touch us. However you want to equate touch, Physically, spiritually, emotionally, he can't touch us. But then you come back and say that the Bible alludes to that. Well, that is in direct opposition to what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the idea is whether advantage or opening the door, the devil has a place. Mm -hmm. The devil yeah. has a place and he's manipulating something, not mm -hmm. controlling them. He's influencing, he's influencing something. Then I would say, yes, I have never heard anybody make a case for Christian having demons based on that verse. Now, if you have, then maybe it's another different set of deliverance ministers. And we could get into that later because all deliverance ministers, we do not agree. Mm -hmm. We do not agree on everything because there are things that I don't agree with. I don't, I'm not even convinced on spirit husband and spirit wife and Marine stuff. I'm, I'm there, but I'm not fully there. Mm -hmm. I just believe. And that's a point though. That's a problem. Because other people say that they believe that you should come out and say, well, I don't agree, but you say, you seem to be saying that you agree. You're not quite there, but you're there based off of what? There is no text in the Bible that says so. And so if you say something that's not in the Bible, you don't think that that's a problem? I believe a Christian can have a demon yeah. and let's help people get set free. So when, when you go to... So you don't believe that the Bible teaches that, but you believe that Christians can have a demon, so let's get them set free. Well, if you're misdiagnosing people, if people really don't have a demon, but you're telling Christians they do have a demon, leading to the believe that, or letting them continue to, to fool themselves into believing that, well, then you do believe that. You do teach that, even though there's no scripture in that. That's dangerous. As a matter of fact, that's unbiblical. Yeah. Corey, oh, I think the yeah. coming. I see. There we go. Here we go. All right, let's let's get serious. All right, he says Corey from Smart Christian says we are prohibited from adding to the text, uh, and he's referencing Deuteronomy four thirty two and First Corinthians four six. Now, before we continue, what I did was, and by the way, I also misspoke. I mistyped. It's not four thirty two. It's Deuteronomy twelve thirty two. Let's go to the text. Let's go to a couple of these passages that I'm bringing up. And here's the danger: whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. Whatever I command you, don't add to what I've told you to. If I told you to do X, Y, and Z, then don't you go add a couple more steps to that. If I told you to do A, B, and C, then don't you take away B or C or A. And don't add D and don't add E. That's what's happening. When you're giving people the, the, the false notion that you could have a demon, the Bible allude, possibly alludes to that when that's not what the text says. 
and you don't want to have the conversation with someone and say, well, this is why the text doesn't say that. That's why the text could not mean that. Well, then it comes across as though you, you have a vested interest in doing so and not really truthfully wanting to deal with the text. Also, Proverbs 35, every word of God is tested, meaning that it's it's covered. It's good. You don't need to have to worry about what it says. Um, I'm, I, does that really work? No, it's tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And look what he says, do not add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. If you value your relationship with Christ, if you value the word of God, do not add to his word. What does that mean? What does that look like? If what you're doing isn't adding to the words, well, then tell me what it looks like when someone does add to the word or when someone takes away from the word. What does it look like? Or 1 Corinthians 4, 6, he says, I figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake so that in us you may learn not to exceed, to go above who pair what is written. Don't go above what is written. Stay in the confines of the text. He doesn't think that we're that smart. Alexander Pagani is not that smart. Uh, Mike Norelli is not that smart. Uh, Isaiah Salivar is not that smart. Corey Miner is not that smart. None of us are that smart, especially enough to go beyond what is written. He's given it to us the way he wanted to give it to us. He didn't need us to add any salt, any pepper, any salsa on anything like that in, to heat it up or, or splice it or change it. No, let's say what it says. Amen. He says, since there are no scriptures or examples of Christians having demons or curses, do you think you might be adding to the word? Uh, no. One, well, 100% no, because I'm not adding to anything. I'm discovering something that I believe can allude to it. That's a big difference. Or six. Now, let's listen to that again. No, I'm not. I'm discovering something that's not in the text that could add to it. He says, since there are no scriptures or examples of Christians having demons or curses, do you think you might be adding to the word? Uh, no. One, well, 100% no, because I'm not adding to anything. I'm discovering something that I believe can allude to it. That's a big difference. I'm not adding to anything. I'm not in. That's not really a big difference. That's just making up something on the way. That's just, ah, uh, that could be, uh, I'm dis what are you discovering? If it's not in the text, you're not discovering it in the text. It could only be experience. I don't know what it could be, but if it's not in the text, what exactly are you discovering that could allude to anything? Emphatically saying, let me say this again, that, that camera's on me. There are no New Testament verses that say a Christian can have a demon in any deliverance minister that says so is lying. All right. And it's being disingenuous. What we have discovered is based on one or two verses, it alludes to it. And therefore we say, hmm. It potentially plausible. That's all it is. It's just, it's plausible. All right. And then we're helping people get delivered. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I'm, pretty much that's it. But no, we're not, yeah. we're not adding, we're not adding to the word. Yes, you are. Um, but it's plausible. We're discovering something from one or two verses that possibly allude to it. That's dangerous. That is, da that literally is how cults are started. That's literally how you confuse people remember in the garden i'm not saying that's what you're doing but it is similar to what we saw in the garden where he says did god say well it's not that what it really is this now he's telling her what this what god's word is alluding to this is what it really means but we know for a fact that's not what it means when you come and say that you've discovered something well why can't we discover why don't we see it it's, it's clearly not a plain text it's not plain by the text and so that's a problem. Uh, but it's not just him, it's also other people. For example, like uh, Mike Signorelli. I want everybody to hear me. There are fundamentals as a disciple. I believe that one of the most demonic things that ever happened is the devil said, I can't stop people from going to church, but I can pervert what church is so much that they think that certain things that all believers should do, only the pastor should do. And I believe that many of us were raised in church where we felt like deliverance, that's the pastor's job. But I just wanna tell you, Matthew chapter 10, verse eight, Jesus said, all right, I'm telling all of you, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Let's go to Matthew 10, because that's not what it said. This is where it becomes, you need to, especially for your pastor in the position, you need to make sure you stick to what the scriptures say. In Matthew 10, 8, this is Jesus 
understand who he's talking to, where he's sending them to. He says, these 12, Jesus sent out after instructing them. So who's he sent? So when you use that passage, let's use it in context. Because there's no passage. Never does, does Jesus ever tell all of us to go out, heal the sick, and cast out demons. That is never a command given by Jesus. And it's certainly not a command that's given by the apostles. The, these are 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So now if we're going to take this as a command for us, well, then we can only do this to Jews. We can only go to Jews. Jesus is instructing his disciples to go to them, to the Jews. And there is a reason for that so that they will be guilty uh, without any excuse of them clearly rejecting Jesus. This is also prophesied coming from the Old Testament. That they're going to do just that. So he says, uh, and by the way, I'm sure you wouldn't say that, well, we'll do the same thing if we come across a Samaritan or a Gentile. We won't talk to them. We won't cast a demon out of them. This is for Israel. It's really not that e that difficult to not see this. And as you go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He'll, well, um, this is them saying the kingdom of heaven is near. This word that's used here. Um, speaks about coming near. Well, it's already here. So we're speaking even of a different dispensation at that time. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. Why? Well, these are the signs. Let them know that what their message is, is true. It's authenticated by these things happening. Freely you received, freely you give. Don't acquire money, gold or silver. Well, are we saying that? Are deliverance ministers not to acquire money? gold or silver. I mean, we're going to stick by the text. We're going to use this text to say Jesus sent out all of us because he did not. If you want to make that apply, make all of it apply. That's the point. So if you're going to make up things, this is the problem that you're going to have with that because someone's going to come back and say, well, wait a second. The scriptures that you quoted says this, and that's not true. Freely, you're going to receive this gift and freely you give. You're not going to be able to do this because you went to seminary. He didn't say that and by the way, you if you're a pastor, I think, now, do you have to go to seminary as a pastor, as a teacher? No. But can we just be honest? It does help. Why? Because when you go to seminary, they they should. Any reputable seminary is going to make you earn your stripes. You're going to do a lot of reading, a lot of research, writing. And in that, in the course of that, you should challenge or debate yourself in your own work. Huh. Is that really what it's saying? Let me see if I can see the other side what do i take away from this what are the what do i notice what are the the cues there what are the observations i observe him saying this to who he's who said it to what they would do what they should not do what's the application what's the implication those are some of the things that you could possibly get from a good seminary also by the way learning the language like i look at the greek word for the word for coming here or coming near at hand Learning the language, Hebrew and Greek, those things can be a benefit. If you are preaching the word, how about learn the word as thoroughly as you can inside and out and begin by learning the actual languages that he gave us his Bible in. That thing that would be helpful. That you're going to have to go through some crazy training course. Matter of fact, he said, I'm going to empower you to do it because you're going to have to depend on my power and my wisdom, my insight. So I want to challenge you. Deliverance is the children's bread. Deliverance is something that we all should do. There is no such passage that says that. And then this passage that keeps coming up, deliverance is the children's bread. Well, that's not that's not true either. Let's go to this passage. This is Matthew 15, 26. Now, Jesus is speaking to a woman uh, or speaking to artists. He's speaking about the lost ship of the house of Israel. And she comes up begging for him to heal her daughter. He says, I was, on, I was only sent to the lost ship of the house of Israel. The same thing that was brought up in, in Luke. She says, um, she began saying, Lord, help me. And he answers, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. What does this have to do with deliverance? Oh, I know. Well, because she's asking for her child to be delivered. But notice what Jesus is speaking of. He's not speaking about deliverance. Uh, but she said, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And he speaks about her great faith. And then from that very hour, her daughter was healed. Well, how do we know that deliverance is not the children's bread. Well, one, it didn't say deliverance is the children's bread. But two, what is the bread? Well, first of all, let's look at a couple of passages. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, speaking of the Lord's Supper, he says, is not the cup of the blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? 
is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ. Since there is one bread, we who are many of one body, for we all partake of the one bread. What is he speaking of? This one bread, this bread that Paul is speaking of. This is why this is brought up with the with the Syrophoenician or the Canaanite woman speaking about this one bread. This is about salvation. That's why he says, I was sent but to the ho household of Israel. But we find out that there is more that are going to be included. And if we just do a quick little word study and just look for the word bread and we find ourselves in John chapter six, look what it says. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread to, out of heaven to eat. Jesus said, surely, truly, I said to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but my father has given you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which has come down out of heaven. They said to us, Lord, always give us this bread. Who or what is he speaking of? Let's go to the, verse 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger and he who believes in me will never thirst. How about verse 41? Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. So you kind of understand the idea, the implication of what he's speaking about, about the bread. Verse 50, this is the bread which has come down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of of the world is my flesh. So what is this bread? The same bread that came down out of heaven. Verse 58 says, not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. So what is the bread? Well, salvation through Christ is the bread that he's speaking of. So now if you want to say salvation is a children's bread, I don't know what you mean by that. Which children? The children that he's speaking of are the children of Israel. So even when you say the children's bread, you need to understand that the children that the Bible or that Jesus is speaking of that's implied here are the Jews. So is deliverance for just the Jews? Is salvation just for the, the, uh, the Jews? Casting demons out just for the Jews? This is why it's helpful for when a preacher speaks, he can actually exegete a text, not trying to make a point uh, to back up his own beliefs or what he might be selling or teaching or preaching or what have you. No, this is why it's vitally important. Again, there's no command for us to go and do that. Well, what about the, the 70 that came out? Well, what about the 70? The 70 that, that Jesus sent out, he gives them those 70 power to do so. And the Bible says that, yeah, they came back. The demons were subject to them because he gave them power. There was no other command about Jesus giving us to do the same thing. Well, what about Mark 16? The Bible does say these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Well, if you trust that this the longer ending of Mark is authentic, I don't believe so. Uh, most textual critics will say also that this was not originally part of it. But uh, who's he speaking of? Is he speaking to the disciples, the apostles, or is he speaking to everyone? Well, this is he's speaking to them because he give it, he's giving them instructions. And these are the signs that follow the apostles. These aren't the signs that, that follow the other disciples. These aren't the signs that follow just the average um, believer. We don't see that happening. And so this could not be, and if it were, well then what about all the other things that are entailed here? For example, uh, I won't talk about the picking up serpents and the poison because some are gonna say, well, that's if those things happen. But it says that they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Is that what you guys are doing? No, that's not what he's, he's not speaking to you. There is no command by Jesus or the apostles for the believers to go out and cast demons out of, of Christians. Now, should we be out there fighting against the works of the enemy? Sure. And how, it, how is the demonic put to flight? By the word of God, by the Holy Spirit. And so the point is, if you're going to say something, you need to say what the scriptures say. If you don't say what the scripture said, if you bring up something, if you discover something that's not in the text, you are literally adding to the text. If that is not adding to the text, then my question to Pagani or anyone else, if that's not adding to the text, well, then what is a legitimate example of someone adding to the text? Why is that not adding to the text? How come anyone else can't discover what the text says? How come the Catholics can't discover uh, these passages relating to the apostles and allude to them having this apostolic succession and forming the Catholic Church. How come Seventh-day Adventists can't discover something and allude to something? How come Jehovah's Witnesses can't discover something 
and allude to something from these verses that the overwhelming majority of other believers, not scholars, but just believers don't agree with. Anyone could follow that train of thought, which is why he says, do not add to the text. And so if, he, if you disagree, fine. Could you please just tell us why you disagree? I think it's that important, that serious, because it affects the way people walk. Amen. <music>